we are hyper-focused on positive experiences, especially for our kids. We want to get them in this sport. We want to get them in this extracurricular activity. We want to take them this, that, and the other place. We want them to have positive experiences, and that's good. And sometimes we want them to have that because we didn't have that. I said, well, I want them to have this thing because I went without, or we had a very meaningful experience. We're like, man, that was really good. I mean, that would really shape me, and I really want my kids to take part of that. And that is all great, too. Nothing wrong with giving our kids positive experiences. What becomes wrong is when we're so focused on experiences, which cost resources, cost time, that we miss focusing on relationships those good relationships that really are going to shape them as they get into adulthood. See, here's what I found out. Some of you know this. By the time we get into our 30s, I mean, we've had a lot of experiences and some were good and some were bad, but the thing that is making life worth living once you reach a certain age is not our experiences anymore because we can always have more of those. Rather, it's our relationships. It's the meaningful relationships that we have and the meaningful work we do with those people we're in meaningful relationship with. So here's the problem. We've got, we've got parents that are hyper-focused. Hey, put all these experiences into kids. Just pump them up full of experiences. And they are experience-rich, but in the pursuit of that, we can become relationally poor. So here's what it looks like. It looks like, well, you know what? I got them you know, I, I got them into the right college or whatever. You know, honestly, I don't remember the last time we sat down and had a heart to heart. I don't remember the last time we had dinner together. But I, you know, I checked it off. I got them the experience. Or we went on that trip and it was really good. But the truth is, you know, I haven't looked them in the eye. I haven't gotten in down into their soul and found out what is troubling them. What is making them tick? Why are they making some of the decisions they're making? So we can be experience rich but then relationally poor. I believe that if aliens came and they just evaluated us for a little while, they might say, hey, you know those humans, when it, when it comes to parenting, I mean, what is really important to them, we can just tell by evaluating them, is they really like to get their kids to a lot of places on time. And they really like to make sure those kids are dressed right and look cool and have the right gadgets. And that would be the report card that maybe a lot of us would get. Maybe I would get that report card. Instead of, you know, they don't do quite as much as maybe we anticipated, but they are deep into the thick of relationship with their kids. They are clearly aiming at equipping their kids to have a meaningful life with regard to their relationships. And guys, this is, this is how it is in our culture. It is normal. This is how the parenting culture goes. It is normal to be experience rich, but relationally Poor. Well, God enters the picture. And God, who actually is the one who makes us parents and grandparents, He gives us grace. He gives us His power. You see, He doesn't ask us, go be a parent and do the best you can. God knows that we're imperfect, God knows that we're broken. God knows that we don't have everything together. He knows if I leave it to them all on their own, they're going to get a lot wrong. So he says, anything that I'm going to call you to, I want to give you the grace to do. I want to put my power on you to do. That's what, when we say grace, we're saying we need God's grace, God's power to do things with his help versus just do things for him. Listen to the way that Paul says it. Paul was telling these Corinthians that he's writing to, see, some people were coming against Paul and they were saying, here's why Paul's unqualified. And even though Paul really had better qualifications than anybody in terms of his pedigree, he was choosing to delight in that which made him weak because Paul had this weird understanding of a mystery that I sometimes kind of get and sometimes don't get. But then when we embrace weakness and admit our dependence on Jesus, he gives us more of his power. And this is the way that he says it in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for power is perfected in weakness. Do we have any folks in here right now or listening that the truth is you would admit, I don't always know what I'm doing. I don't always get this right. I mean, there's, there's times, I mean, I'm just straight up clueless. If we're ready to go there, then I can, I can tell you on the authority of God's word that his grace is for you. 
His power is for you. The, the place he wants to rest his power, the, the parent that he wants to get in their life and say, I'm going to pour extra wisdom on you. I'm going to give extra understanding to you. I'm going to help you discern things that are going on in their heart that you never know because you're willing to admit weakness, because you're willing to admit dependence, because you're going to say, Jesus, you are the ultimate parent, and I'm going to need your help to parent these kids in a way that brings you glory. Here's your bottom line. We're candidates for God's power as we admit our need for his grace. We are candidates for God's power as we admit our need for his grace. There was a major research project called the National Study of Youth and Religion. And they wanted to know, hey, what goes into a young person who started out as a Christ follower after high school? What keeps them following Christ? What keeps them moving forward and prevailing in their walk with God? Here's what they found. They found that teenagers are most likely to retain their Christian faith into adulthood if they have meaningful and healthy relationship with their parents, a faithful Christian mentor outside the family, and with God himself. What what did that project just describe? Three relationships. Three relationships that are crucial, that parents need to ask some questions about, about these three relationships in in our young ones and the people we influence in their lives. So let me ask you these questions. These questions are gonna be some... uh, So they're going to bring some definition to this series. If you get nothing else out of this series, if you just ask these three questions, you're going to be better equipped to parent whatever stage your kids are at, whether they're six or 60, you're going to be better equipped to help influence them positively. Here's the questions. Number one, what are you doing to enhance your child's relationship with you? What are you doing to enhance? What are you doing to, to, to get that child closer to you? Number two, what are you doing to advance your child's relationship with God. So if they're still in the home, when they leave the home, they're convinced I am someone who is accountable to a real God and I'm on the hook for pursuing him. And number three, what are you doing to influence your child's relationships outside the home? And we don't just mean protect them from bad kids or bad folks or whatever, but influence them toward people that relationally speaking, are probably going to bring along some game changers into their life because those folks are tremendously positive influence on them. And what are you and I doing as parents to help that? See, here's what we know. With regard to these questions, it's not a question of whether or not we're influencing kids in this way. We definitely are. The question is, are we doing it intentionally? So you may be doing, you may be negatively influencing your kids in those directions, or you may be positively influencing them, but we're not asking that question. We're asking, are you and I doing it intentionally? Meaning, are we recognize God has delegated this responsibility to me, and so by golly, I'm going to do it. I'm going to be the one. I'm going to think it through. I'm going to make sure for the rest of my years on this planet, I'm going to do whatever I can, whether it's the child that I babysit, whether it's my own kids, whether it's my grandkids, whether it's the neighbor kid across the street, I'm going to do whatever I can do to be a positive influence in that child's life. So here's what I'm going to ask everybody to do. I'm going to ask you today to take responsibility for being an intentional spiritual influence in your child's life. Take Responsibility. Can somebody say take responsibility? responsibility. You guys know this. There's so many awesome parents here, but, but the reason you're awesome, if you're awesome, is because at some point you decided it was on you. You decided it was on you. It wasn't on anybody else. It wasn't on the church. It wasn't on the school. It wasn't on anybody but you to take responsibility for an intentional spiritual influence in your child's life. Can somebody say, I will be an intentional influence? 